In our service this morning, we're going to begin with a uh, repeat from last week by popular demand. <laughs> <laughs> the Wagner children will uh, momentarily sing for us, uh, and they sang last Sunday, Hosanna. Uh, it's a wonderful song, a great way to open our service, and then also uh, as a special opening to our service, uh, after the call of worship, Joseph Wagner will sing the palms for us. So we have a very uh, wonderful service to get started. Um, we'll be making use of our Blue Trinity hymnal, so if you follow along with that along the way, uh, we'll be able to follow the service well enough. So at this time, uh, I'd like to ask the Wagner children to come up and uh, if you come and sing. I'm going to sit down for just a moment. I guess to make sure we have a video camera. I guess we're okay.
Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray that as we gather before you in your heavenly courts, that your Spirit would strengthen us for worship, that Christ would be magnified and exalted among us, that his love would meet the need of each one here this day. We ask your mercies on us in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's remain standing and we'll confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father. Like a dove, 
and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Continuing in the epistle of Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning with the 13th verse. 1 Peter chapter 1. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we thank you for your holy word and for the promises made through Isaiah the prophet of one who would come, your chosen servant, on whom your spirit would rest, and that one would bring us liberty from our sin, deliverance, and salvation. And we thank you that John the Baptist declared that this Jesus was he of whom all the scriptures spoke, Jesus on whom your spirit descended like a dove. This one is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. With Peter we confess that this one's blood was precious, that his blood is unique and divinely powered to save us from our sins. We thank you for Jesus and his work on the cross and for the salvation that he's accomplished for us, deliverance from sin and death, granting us life and eternal life. We pray for your blessing on us this day that we would see Jesus in his glory, trust on him as the Lamb of God who is slain for us, in whose name we pray.
section of that chapter, a chapter which uh, expresses our understanding of what the scriptures have to say about Jesus Christ, the mediator. And so we'll look at the first section today, and it's a very meaty section. There's so much in here that we could spend months just on this one section, but we'll just try to handle it today. Section 1 reads as follows, It pleased God in His eternal purpose to choose and ordain the Lord Jesus, His only begotten Son, to be the mediator between God and man, the prophet, priest, and the king, the head and savior of His church, the heir of all things, and judge of the world, unto whom He did from all eternity give a people, to be his seed, and to be by him in time redeemed, called, justified, sanctified, and glorified. We may not think too much about the name of Christ, that particular aspect of Jesus' name. It's actually a title given to him, which signifies that he is the one who is anointed of God. He is set apart by God for a special office. He is commissioned by God to fulfill a certain role in history. The confession begins by noting that this purpose of God begins in eternity past. God in the councils of eternity made a plan for the whole of history. In the course of that, he would send the Christ to redeem his people from their sins. Jesus would be especially equipped to fulfill that purpose as the Christ. And so God has an eternal purpose, begun in eternity, to find a people and bring them to Christ, and have Christ stand for them, represent them by his life, death, and resurrection. Christ stands for his own people. And this was established by God in His eternal purpose and plan. He chose and ordained the Lord Jesus. He set Him apart and commissioned Him for His particular office. He was uniquely qualified as God's only begotten Son. He was the Son of God who entered into this world and took on our humanity, such that being fully God and fully man, he was fully equipped to do all that was necessary for our salvation. No one else could do what he did, not even a good man. If a good man were to lay down his life, he would die only perhaps for himself, but even his own sins would have to be atoned for. He would not get beyond that. Jesus is fully God and fully man, a perfect man, and uniquely qualified to serve in this role as our mediator. The Christ is a mediator. He is one who intercedes between God and men. Mankind often does not recognize its need for a mediator. We intend to stand before God on our own, and we will live life as we please. The scriptures assure us that if we pursue that path, we will perish. Because of our sin against a holy, righteous God, we must perish except there is a mediator who stands in our place, someone who comes in between God and man. Jesus occupies that unique role. Again, he's uniquely qualified. He addresses our sin with a, a sacrifice of infinite value so that it can satisfy the, the sin against a holy, infinite God. It's a sin of infinite value such that it can wash away the sins of all of God's people. So he's the mediator the one who intercedes between God and men. As the Christ, he occupies three offices, prophet, priest, and king. As prophet, he proclaims God's word and tells us how we should live before the Lord. As priest, he intercedes for us and provides a sacrifice for our sins. As king, he rules over us. He rules over all things and rules especially over his church. He occupies those offices in the course of his earthly ministry, and now as he is ascended on high in heaven above. He is the head and savior of the church. He is the one who leads the church, who governs the church, who orders the church according to his will. He is the one who has saved the church from her sins and brought her to a right relationship with God. 
He is the heir of all things. Everything will be given over to him for his glory and praise, and he will be the judge of the world. Jesus is our mediator in that he intercedes for us and makes us right with God. He is also the judge, our judge, the judge of all mankind. All men will appear before this Jesus who walked on this earth, and they will give an account before God for how they have lived. And this Jesus will judge. He will have mercy on those who call upon him, those who knew him. But those who did not know him, he will say, depart from me, for I never knew you. And so Jesus is the judge of all mankind. He's uniquely appointed for that role. No one else in history and time would be qualified to do that. He's the judge of the world. And God has given to this one, who is uniquely qualified, a people to be his seed or his descendants, those who are his family, and to be by him in time redeemed, called, justified, sanctified, and glorified. Note the complete package here that is presented for us. Jesus does it all. He calls us, justifies us, that is, makes us right with God, removing our sins, giving us a right record before God such that we're perfectly righteous in God's sight because of Him. He sanctifies us in the course of this life, provides us that we would grow more and more in holiness and righteousness, and He glorifies us at the end of time. When we pass from this life, our souls immediately go into the presence of the Lord into glory. And there will come a time when He will come at the end of history to raise the dead and to glorify His people ushering them into a new world, a perfect world, with new glorified resurrected bodies. Jesus does it all. Do you trust in Him? Is He your mediator? Do you rest on Him and His work alone? Or would you reject that and continue to hold to what you can do, what you can accomplish on your own? Trust in Jesus. He's your only hope. The only one, the only mediator, mediator given between God and men, Jesus Christ. For our next hymn this morning, we'll sing number 131. When the fields the sky, we will sing verses 1 and then the last 3, 4, 5, and 6. And what I'd like to do is have the ladies sing verse number 4 and the men sing number uh, and then all join together on the end. Okay, so number 131, when morning gills the sky, and we'll stand to sing. <laughs>
first letter, chapter 15. And we'll pick up our reading with the 12th verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule, every authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. I pray, Father, that as we look to your word this morning, that your spirit would bless the preaching of your word and the hearing of it to your glory and praise. We pray that you would build up the faith of your church, strengthen us in this world, that our hope in Christ would be made secure as it rests in the risen Lord. In whose name we pray. Last year about this time, magazine posted a report about people's experiences of uh, the afterlife. In near-death experiences, folks who uh, seem to have passed away from this life, their heart stopped, brain activity stopped, they seem to be dead on the table, uh, they report having a moment when they feel their consciousness rising up out of their body, and they look out over the body, perhaps over the room, they see what's going on, they hear what's going on, and then they move into a tunnel and approach a bright light. Soon they are welcomed by someone, a, a very warm and loving individual. Different reports about who they meet in that heavenly realm, but soon they are sent back to the body begrudgingly and, and returned back to life. And reports like this make some people wonder, is there life after death? Does this in fact prove that we pass on from this world into another world? into another life, that there's a future after the grave. Time reports that there are scientists who try to explain this in mechanical terms and try to explain that these kinds of experiences are merely uh, the effect of dying on the human body and how the mind tends to become absorbed into this tunnel-like experience where other things are driven away. And mind, the mind begins to hallucinate. The problem with that is, a lot of times, these people have no brain activity, at least as this 
measured by our, our uh, computers and so forth. A near-death experience, does that show us that there's life after death? A survey of uh, Americans by the Pew Foundation discovered that uh, the, the number of those who are called nuns or none of the above, those who don't attend church, are not interested in attending church, uh, is increasing across the United States. More and more young people, particularly the millennials, are growing up without a faith in God or a, a recognition of the scriptures or a desire to serve Jesus Christ. They check the box, none of the above. Now, further evaluation of these young people discovers that they're not all entirely given over to atheism. They're not all asserting that there is no God. Many of them believe that there is a God. Uh, they they uh, believe that there may be a life after death or some who think that way, but there's no certainty in that regard. Is there life after death? How can we know that? What justification is there for saying such a thing? When Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, he's addressing a congregation that had similar concerns. Perhaps they had been adopting the Greek philosophy of their day, of their culture, which suggests that the, the body is a prison house for the soul, and that when you pass from this life, your soul goes off into another realm. It's purified of this physical life and enters into a more spiritual, intellectual realm. For the Greek, this was desirable. It was to be desired that the body be left aside, and any thought of the resurrection of a body was anathema to a Greek philosopher. And so it may be that a certain measure of skepticism with regard to the resurrection of the body swept through the congregation there at Corinth, or at least there was some measure, folks, within that church who held to that opinion. There is no resurrection of the body. There is no resurrection of the dead. Now, that has significant consequences. And Paul addressed that in his, uh, towards the, the close of this letter, when he addresses the resurrection of the dead. And the point that he makes in part, is that our understanding of the resurrection of the dead, of our resurrection, particularly our bodily resurrection from the dead, is intimately connected, directly connected to the truth of whether Jesus Christ rose from the dead. We can assert that there is a resurrection of the body at the end of history and time because Jesus himself rose from the dead. However, by logic, if you deny that there is any resurrection of the dead, no bodies are going to rise up, then by sheer force of logic, Jesus himself was not raised from the dead. Now, Paul is not afraid to be logical, reasonable, and to follow propositions to the proper conclusions. If you assert that the dead are not raised, well, that has implications all through your faith, all through your understanding of Christianity. And what Paul says is that an argument against the resurrection of the dead destroys Christian faith. They hang together. Now, quite often on an Easter Sunday morning, uh, the pastor will often... <laughs> will often argue for the fact that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And I'm not going to go through all the evidences of that because we've considered that in, recent, in, in past Sundays. Paul gives you that evidence in the first part of this chapter. Multiple witnesses, multiple occasions, uh, seeing Jesus, touching him, eating a meal with him, listening to him, talk to them. This could not be an hallucination. I like what... You'll be surprised by this, I'm sure. I like what Alexander McLaren says about this. <laughs> when he says that those who suggest that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was merely an hallucination experienced by the disciples are themselves under an hallucination. It's crazy to think that. Jesus appeared to multiple people, multiple times, multiple occasions, multiple settings. This is all hallucinatory? That's crazy. You can't just dismiss that. The ones who are asserting that are themselves delusional. 
That's crazy thinking. But the modern mind needs to reject Jesus Christ and all that he stands for, and then therefore they will grasp any straw, grasp anything that can keep them away to accountability before Jesus Christ. Whatever is available to hold on to that, no matter what the consequences. The point I'd like to make this morning, however, is granting the truth of Christ's resurrection. This is not merely an assertion made to show that God can work miracles, that He's still at work in history and time, and He can do an amazing thing. There is more to the resurrection than simply a proclamation that God does amazing things in history and time. And this is just happens to be one of them. No, there is a deep connection uh, between the resurrection of Jesus Christ and our hope for the future. Between our resurrection, our standing before God, and that resurrection now two millennia ago. Our hope is rooted in that resurrection. Paul goes through the argument in the first part of the, the section we read, verses 12, I believe, through 18. He shows the consequences for skepticism and unbelief. If you say there's no resurrection, by force of logic, Jesus did not rise from the dead. If that's the case, then there are all kinds of consequences we need to come to grips with. Your faith is futile. It's foolish for you to trust in Jesus and to follow after Him. That makes no sense. I was reading a, an article in or a blog uh, sponsored by Christianity Today in which uh, a pastor gives us pastors some advice about five mistakes to avoid in your Easter sermon. <laughs> I got them all down. <laughs> but the last one was where I hoped there was something that I could say amen to. But he fell rather short. He did begin by saying that one of the problems that Christian preaching has today is that it focuses so much on the death of Christ and the pains and the agonies of the cross. You think of Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, which so focused on the death of Christ. But the resurrection of Christ, the new life of Christ, his ascension, is only hinted at. And much of preaching today focuses solely, almost entirely, on the cross of Christ. And the resurrection is something of an afterthought. Just to tie in the story and wrap it all up, give it a good, good ending to it so we can all feel good and walk away. There's more to the resurrection than that. The resurrection is fundamental to the work of Christ on the cross. It tells us that Christ's death on the cross was not futile or empty or useless. When he went there to pay the penalty for our sins, he paid it all, and his resurrection affirms that it was accepted by God. There's no more penalty to be paid for sin. Jesus is risen. The resurrection certifies for us that our sins are wiped away, that the sacrifice on the cross was sufficient, that Jesus was indeed the righteous one who became our substitute, Bearing our sin. The resurrection affirms the full atonement for our sins. And so it grants us confidence that we can know our sins are forgiven. Why? Because Jesus died on the cross, yes, but because he also rose from the dead <coughs> and ascended into heaven. <coughs> Your redemption is complete because of what Jesus did. And his resurrection affirms that. Further, the resurrection affirms for us a future glory for ourselves. We evangelicals reformed often emphasize the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was not merely raised in the memory and the hearts of his people, a story that enlivens them and quickens them, uh, encourages them to live a new life. He rose bodily from the grave. And that is essential for us to hold. It's not merely the resurrection of a spirit 
or the, the propagation of a myth that continues in the hearts of people today. No, his body stepped out of that grave. His body stood before the disciples in the upper room. His body was open for their investigation. Jesus said to Thomas, put your hands in my, 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 my side and in my hands. See the nail holes and all the rest of it. Know that I am he. He sat down with his disciples at the, the shores of Galilee and ate food with them. It was a body, the same body with which he was crucified. And the Bible of Christian faith is very much committed to your bodies. We're not just talking about your spiritual life and, and perhaps an afterlife in a mystical realm, but your body will rise from the dead. If you are joined to Jesus Christ, it will be perfected, made new, righteous, pure, holy, powerful. Because Jesus rose from the dead. Paul makes this analogy between Jesus and Adam and presents them as the two heads of humanity. And I would remind you here, Paul, by so doing, asserts the historic nature of Adam in the Garden of Eden. If Jesus was a historic figure of whom, Jesus, of whom Paul preached, then Adam also certainly was a historic figure because they, they too have the same relationship to all their descendants. Adam brings death into the world by his sin and rebellion. We inherit his sinful nature that affects us all. So in Adam, all of humanity must die. And every day we die. We die. Because we are descendants of Adam. Each one here, except Christ returns, will die. We are joined to Adam. But man, Christ is risen from the dead. Christ is the second Adam. And all who are joined to him will be raised to new life. Adam's sin brings death, Christ's righteousness. His resurrection brings life to all who are included in him. And so Christ brings about a new humanity, a new people of God. All who are joined to him will be raised from the dead. It's not a universal kind of salvation. It's only those who are included in Christ through a living faith. And we know that from the rest of the scripture. In any case, Paul assures us that we had hope for the future. Our faith is not futile. The preaching that Paul makes is not futile and vain. All these things mean something to us so that we can look forward to the future in hope that we will rise again today. All because Jesus rose. I like the way Paul makes the transition from verses 12 through 18 to verse 19 and following. He says, but now Christ is risen from the dead. This is an uncontrovertible fact. Jesus is risen from the dead. And all kinds of consequences flow through that. He is risen, so you too may have new life. He is risen, so there's hope for the grave. He is risen, so he has rule and dominion over all. And you bring all of history to its final conclusion. Now, the eschatological aspects of this we could dwell on at a later time. I had nothing to do with it. The, the point we need to see here is that the resurrection assures us, too, that Jesus is the Lord of all. He will bring all of human history to a close. He will uh, overthrow all rule and dominion and power set against him. And he will usher in the new eternal age when the dead will be raised. I see this, and I, I know others have a different point of view. Others try to say that what we have here is after Christ returns, there's a, a period of time which he reigns on the earth for a thousand years, and then the end comes after that, judgment occurs after that. To me, that's like the like Miriam Freighter that was driven ashore on the Delaware this weekend and plowed into the banks of the Delaware, uh, uh, frightening everyone who saw it. It's bringing a boatload of theology into a, a, a gap between verse 23 and 24. And I find it very hard.
hard to do that. To me, it's much simpler to see when Christ returns at the end, he brings in the final judgment, the dead are raised, the righteous go to life, the wicked go to their judgment, and the new age begins. It's very simple. His kingdom is now. He's ruling over all now. He has dominion over all the principalities and powers now. Jesus, when he ascended to heaven before his disciples, said, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. That was 2,000 years ago. He reigns now as king. He's not waiting for something to come in the future. He's king now. We need to come before him. Confess to him our sins. Believe in his work of salvation. And follow him. Do you trust in this Jesus who is risen from the dead? Our preaching needs to be received by faith. And that is a work of God by His Spirit, producing faith in each heart. So that you see and understand the truth. Understand it for you and its impact on you. It doesn't matter if we're talking about intellectual fears or something or what have you. What matters is what matters to you, your heart, your life, to receive this message in faith, trusting God's Word, trusting the many witnesses that confirm it. Do you follow Christ? If you do, you will live, live a new life, a transformed life, a life with hope, peace, and joy. And God will do amazing things through you. I'll just conclude with this. There are many things I can conclude with, but to read a story about a woman who is in England. Uh, her, her first name is Amy, her last name is something like Laura Hartman or something like that. In any case, she is an apologist at Oxford University. And she goes about trying to defend the Christian faith. When she was 19 years of age, she and two of her friends went over to Afghanistan in 1996. They went under the covers being journalists for the university news, uh, I think it was more of a journal. In any case, they go over there and they see, amazingly, God opens the way for them. This is the time of the Taliban. Taliban in control, cutting people off, you know, the heads off, and forcing Sharia law all over the country. They enter into the country, and they have to pass through 12 different military checkpoints along the way. They got a bunch of Bibles along there with them, tucked away. Each checkpoint, they're right on through. They even gain access to the top military commanders among the Taliban. And they sit down with them and begin interviewing the top military Taliban leaders. And just slowly, quietly talk to them about religious things as well, about Jesus. At the end of this amazing interview, he's not more than teenagers, 19, 20 years of age or so. One of the gentlemen in the group gives the, the head of the Department of Education there in Afghanistan a copy of the Bible. That was a very bold thing to do. Risking their lives. And yet what happens? He receives that Bible and says, oh, thank you so much. I've been praying to God that I would have a copy of this Bible. I will read it through without stop until I get to the very end. Thank you so much. And then he went away from that, saying, God can do amazing things. Jesus is the God who is risen from the dead. His power is at work in you to do great and wonderful things. Trust in him. Follow after him. And see what he can do. You'll be amazed. Father, we thank you for your word today, and we thank you for the glorious message of Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. And we pray that your hand of blessing will be on your word, that it will bring life and salvation to many this day, to all who are included in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's respond to the ministry of God's word by bringing before the Lord our morning tithes and offerings. <laughs>
ourselves these offerings to you, that you would bless them for your glory and praise, and advance the kingdom of Christ in this place and around the world. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You see your sins. Our next hymn is number 714. <coughs> Not on the other hand, so you can use your number 714 with harps and with vials. Number 714 for a
Father, we thank you that you have granted us the forgiveness of our sins through Jesus Christ, and that his blood continues to wash our consciences clean of every dark spot. We pray that you would renew us and strengthen us by faith, strengthen our hope in the coming resurrection of all things. We pray that you would help us to fix our minds on Jesus, who is in heaven above, and we with him. And we pray, O oh God, that you grant us victory in this life, that we would live by the power of the resurrection, that we would live new lives for your glory and praise, that we would be faithful to you, even to death, that we would not fear death, because the sting of death has been taken away. We thank you for your glorious resurrection, and pray that our lives would be resurrected lives, live to your glory and praise. We pray for our church that you would strengthen us by faith to serve you and to advance your gospel throughout our community, pray for your blessing and our witness to family, friends, neighbors, workmates, and all around us. We pray, Lord, that you would graciously uh, work in the hearts of, of, of those who are near and dear to us and bring them to, to Christ. We thank you, Lord, for our church and pray for your blessing on it. We thank you for our community and pray that we be at work, bring help to those who are in need. We pray that you would strengthen those who are weak. We pray, Lord, that you would tend to those who are ill. We pray that you would bring safety to those who are in trouble. We thank you for those who serve in a variety of ways throughout our community, as teachers, as uh, emergency people, as uh, medical uh, staff. We pray, Lord, for these and many others that you would watch over and provide for them and their needs. Father, we pray that you would bless the work of your church as it goes from this place and around the world. We thank you for the work of your church in distant places, and we pray that you would sustain the missionary efforts of those who serve in foreign fields. We thank you for those who serve in Japan, in China, uh, in Uganda, in South Africa, and across the world. We pray, Lord, that your blessing will be on each one, that you would strengthen them and prosper your work. We thank you for the great news of uh, many coming to faith in Christ across Africa. We thank you for the news as well of people across China coming to faith in Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that you would cause these works to flourish and abound. And we pray that you would uh, bring wisdom and understanding to uh, your church in these distant places. They would serve you even in the midst of very hostile circumstances. Uh, watch over those who are in prison. We pray for Pastor Saeed Abedini. We pray that you would have mercy on him and those with him. Deliver them from their enemies. We pray that you bring him home safely. And pray that you would watch over others as well. We commit ourselves to you and to your care and ask that you would teach us to pray even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power of and the glory of forever. Amen. For our final item this morning, number 216, Crown Give With Me. 